my good. Oh, I, don't tell me you were half dressed either. Okay, good morning, everyone. A couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, Lost and Found is at registration. So far, we've collected a credit card, a necklace, and a glove. Just one, not a pair. The uh, credit card, you would actually have to tell us your name uh, and match it up to the card, and then we'll go in and look and see what you've bought lately and probably chastise you for it. Um, T-shirts <laughs> are still available at registration. Get them before they sell out. Uh, at the noon session, um, let's see. Oh, okay, that's the next one there. Um, has anyone been watching the Ustream stuff? Do you guys know that we're Ustreaming? Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> don't. Uh, don't waste the bandwidth by watching the Ustream video here in the hotel. I mean, I, I know after a couple of beers, it's nice to just sit down. But, you know, we did provide these big rooms and chairs and all that kind of stuff. So come on in and watch them instead of watching the, the Ustream video over the, lo the local network. Um, you ready? So we'll bring up uh, John Larimer. His uh, talk is on USB auto run attacks against Linux. That's what's listed in the program, although the slide has something a little bit different. But it's all going to be the same kind of fun. Thanks, guys. All right, uh, morning everyone. Thanks for uh, dragging your ass out of bed and getting here this early. I appreciate it. Um, so my name is John Larimer. And I'm a security researcher on the IBM X-Force team, uh, uh, the advanced research and development team based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And my talk this morning is about auto run vulnerabilities. And these are vulnerabilities that, um, that can allow code to execute whenever a removable storage device is connected to a PC. And last week I gave a similar talk at Black Hat here in DC, uh, but the focus of that was mostly Windows. And I only spent a little bit of time talking about Linux, uh, just like the last 10 minutes of the talk. But my entire presentation today is uh, focused on Linux, and specifically I'm talking about Ubuntu Desktop Linux 10.10, uh, the 32-bit version, which is the latest one that is currently out. Uh, so some of the stuff that I'm talking about today uh, also can apply to other distributions, and but it's mostly desktop distributions. The server editions um, don't have some of the same uh, UI components that I'll be talking about today. And uh, because I'm talking about Ubuntu, I'm also uh, talking about specific issues with the GNOME desktop environment, uh, which probably don't apply to other editions of Ubuntu that don't use GNOME, like K-Ubuntu and some of the other uh, distributions out there. All right, so let's talk about auto-run malware. Worms that spread on Windows using the autorun.inf file are generally referred to as auto-run worms, and auto-run is also a kind of a generic name given to uh, variants of these worms. And basically what happens is that you can insert a CD or a DVD or a USB flash drive, and Windows will read this autorun.inf file and uh, automatically execute some program that's on it. And it's a pretty big security risk. Uh, because basically everyone disables the auto run feature on Windows now, and Microsoft actually changed the way uh, that Windows 7 handles auto run programs so they won't run from USB drives anymore. Um, so malware authors started exploiting vulnerabilities to get the same functionality. So has anyone here heard of the Stuxnet worm? Anyone? <laughs> and, uh, so so I'm, uh, I'm sure you're all sick of hearing it, so I'm only going to mention it once. Um, so it used a vulnerability in how Windows handled shortcut files uh, to allow it to load an arbitrary DLL file from the USB drive. And it was able to spread physically on USB drives without using auto run. And that's kind of what inspired the research that I'm doing today. Um, some, of the, some other uh, examples are, uh, if you've ever done research on malicious PDF files in Windows, you might have noticed that um, some of these PDFs will automatically infect your machine or trigger the exploit without you even opening the file if you're uh, looking at the preview mode. And the most recent example that I could come up with in Windows was uh, a BMP. Um, it was a, a vulnerability in uh, certain types of document files that had an embedded bitmap file. And uh, there was a problem parsing that, and it allowed code execution uh, when loading the icon for that file. All right, so I'm done talking about Windows. Um, so I'm not aware of any uh, major outbreaks of auto-run malware on Linux systems. And it used to be that Linux just didn't really have the feature set that would even allow this. Um, USB drives weren't automatically mounted, and there were no thumbnails or previews in the desktop environment. And in general, the desktop experience of Linux was pretty weak compared to, uh, say, Windows or Mac. And I'm not really sure why, but there are some free desktop.org specifications that allow auto-run files on removable storage devices on Linux. Uh, and these scripts could have a few different names, uh, .autorun, autorun, or autorun.sh. Um, 
Uh, but whenever a new volume is mounted, uh, the desktop could be looking for these files to run. And uh, luckily for the security of Linux users everywhere, the, spe the specifications actually prohibit running the programs automatically. So it's always going to ask you. Um, so uh, if you, unless you find a vulnerability in like, the way that these files are parsed, they're not really that useful uh, for exploiting security vulnerabilities. Unless you're just dumb enough to click yes to run the script if you haven't actually read it. But I don't think anyone that uses Linux is going to do that because they're all smart people. Um, so since the auto run features in Linux seems relatively safe, what about taking advantage of security vulnerabilities? So it turns out that there is a whole bunch of code that executes uh, in a desktop Linux system when a new mass storage device, like a USB flash drive, is connected to a PC. And a lot of this code hasn't been audited for vulnerabilities yet, which means it could be full of bugs. Um, so at the lowest level of the operating system, there are uh, the removable storage subsystem bus drivers. And these are the low-level buses like USB, eSATA, FireWire, uh, PCMCIA, or PC card, or SD card, or uh, so things like that. And slightly above that are the file system drivers. And these drivers are responsible for parsing the uh, low-level data structures on the raw disk sectors that represent files and directories and uh, permissions. So there's a lot of complicated features in file systems nowadays, like uh, compression, uh, compression and encryption. There's journaling and permissions stored there. And there's all sorts of stuff that's represented as met metadata in the, uh, in the raw disk sectors themselves. And there's also a uh, user mode file system drivers. In Ubuntu, the NTFS driver is NTFS 3G, which is a fused file system driver. And that code, uh, it doesn't run in the kernel. It actually runs as whatever user mounted the volume. And then at the highest levels, at kind of the most abstract and farthest away from the actual physical device code-wise, um, are the desktop applications that process files. And today, uh, specifically, I'm going to be talking about how thumbnails are generated for files uh, on the desktop. So it's pretty important that you realize that a vulnerability at any of these layers um, could allow an attacker to gain control of a system just by inserting a USB flash drive. Or uh, they could be used to propagate malware. And some of the attacks can be uh, executed remotely, like a thumbnailer file or a thumbnailer vulnerability could be executed or could be uh, exploited or, uh, remotely. All right, so I'd like to talk a little bit about attacks involving uh, physical access to PCs. And it's possible to exploit vulnerabilities that let you execute code if you have physical access to a machine. And normally that's something that is considered game over. If an attacker has physical access, they could just steal the machine or steal the hard drive. Um, but of course, not all important machines can be 100% physically secure. So uh, there are a lot of security measures that can be taken on the system, like BIOS passwords and full disk encryption. And there are some uh, really awesome attacks against full disk encryption. My personal favorite is the FireWire DMA, physical memory access issue. And it's basically a feature of FireWire that a uh, connected device can have access to physical memory on the machine. And it has read and write access. And uh, so there are tools out there that let you connect a computer to another PC over the FireWire port, and it'll unlock the screensaver for you. And that's pretty, pretty freaking awesome. And there's also the cold boot attack, which is well, it's kind of lame compared to the uh, FireWire issue. So the way that the cold boot attack works is uh, that you reset the system and boot a minimal OS off of a removable storage device. Or you can even actually remove the memory from the system if you freeze it. And some guys uh, released a paper on this. I think it was last year or 2009. So, uh, so, but unless you're actually stealing the memory or swapping out an internal drive, um, you have to be able to boot off of uh, external media and that can be easily disabled or you could just set up a BIOS password to disable that kind of attack. So that brings us to uh, removable storage attacks. And so many desktop, or many desktop uh, operating systems out there will automatically mount file systems on USB devices that are connected to the PC. And that's really only part of the problem, but I'll get into some of the other issues a little later. And you actually don't even really need physical access to attack a machine with a USB flash drive. You can just mail it to someone and kind of social engineer them into connecting it to their computer, like tell them it's uh, naked pictures of their wife on it or something. Um, so uh, the interesting thing about exploits involving remo removable storage is that they can either run in kernel mode or as the currently logged on user, depending on which layer that you're attacking. This means that if the logged on user has full disk encryption enabled or they have true crypt volumes that are mounted, you can read the data directly from those encrypted volumes if you can execute code as uh, in the same context of the user. And that's one of the reasons why I think that this type of attack is uh, pretty serious and it's important that you protect yourself against them if you care anything at all about uh, security. So first off, I want to talk about uh, how the USB drivers work in Linux. The USB drivers live in the driver's USB directory of the Linux kernel source tree. And the host controller drivers deal with the host controller, and that's the part of the USB architecture that facilitates communication 
uh, between the operating system and the individual USB devices. And then there is a hub driver that handles USB hubs, which are similar to Ethernet hubs. At least they offer kind of a similar functionality that you can plug a lot of USB devices into a single hub and connect it to a single USB port on the machine. Um, and drivers for individual USB devices or device classes, uh, like the mass storage class, register themselves using a function called uh, either USB register or USB register driver. And this lets the USB subsystem know which vendor and product IDs that the driver uh, works with. And the USB subsystem itself contains a function named uh, USB match ID that matches a newly connected device with a loaded device driver, if there is one. So knowing how the Linux USB subsystem works is pretty important if you're looking to exploit vulnerabilities in USB drivers. And you have to know, how, you have to know where the code is to be able to audit it, and you need to know which functions get called when uh, different events happen to be able to uh, find bugs in it. So um, a vulnerability in a USB driver could be considered pretty high value because it runs in kernel mode, and it gives you full access to the system. And a company called MWR Info Security found a vulnerability in the device driver for the hours walled USB ISDN device. And this was a straight buffer overflow. It happened, uh, the driver was improperly handling USB string descriptors. And there have, probably been, there have probably been other vulnerabilities discovered in USB drivers, but that's the first one that shows up on a Google search, so that's, that's my example. And there's not really that many people that are actively looking for vulnerabilities in USB drivers, but like I said, they can be pretty serious. Uh, some of the more recent research that I've seen involves fuzz testing. Um, and, uh, so Mortiz Jodier wrote a paper about using a hardware and software solution in 2009, and he used a programmable USB uh, development board to, to do his testing. And then last year, uh, a guy named Tobias Mueller, he uh, implemented an all software solution. He basically used QEMU, or KEMU, however you want to pronounce it. Um, he wrote a virtual USB device that did, uh, that did fuzzing against file system drivers. So that's pretty interesting. Um, you could also uh, implement something similar in Box or any of the other virtualization environments out there, but it's, uh, that's nice because you don't have to know how to program a microcontroller or write any low-level firmware code. You could just uh, write a soft, totally software-based virtual USB device. And there's probably been a lot more research out there um, than what Jody A. and Mueller have done, but uh, those guys should probably work on their uh, search engine optimization because those are the only two examples that I found. And uh, so if you find a vulnerability in a USB device driver, you can use a programmable USB development board to write an actual exploit for it. There's a thing called Teensy USB, which uh, some of you guys have probably heard about it. It's been talked about a lot. But uh, it's, it's even smaller than a regular USB flash drive. And you can program it to be any device that you want. And you can make it re respond to the device drivers themselves with any sort of data that you want. And the Teensy USB costs under $20. And unlike some of the other uh, USB development boards, it can cost hundreds. So they're really easy to get a hold of. They're really, really easy to program. They're easy to conceal. And uh, so they do make an excellent vector for delivering a driver exploit. Uh, so this slide has some information on how support for the Linux USB mass storage class is implemented in the Linux kernel. And it basically works by um, tying the USB subsystem in with a SCSI subsystem. And most USB mass storage devices actually use the SCSI command set, and it's layered on top of the USB protocol stack. And that makes it really easy to add uh, USB support to an operating system that already supports SCSI disks. And that's also the reason that a USB flash drive will show up in the dev directory with uh, SCSI names like SDB or SDC. Um, and if you, you can run dmessage and look at the kernel messages, and you'll see that the SCSI su subsystem is invoked for USB mass storage devices. So that's somewhere else that you could possibly be looking for vulnerabilities in the uh, SCSI stuff, which probably hasn't really been uh, audited for vulnerabilities. Uh, so now I'll talk about some of the higher level user mode subsystems that are involved in recognizing and notifying the uh, system of new storage devices. Uh, UDEV is the user mode device manager for Linux. It's been in use for a few years. Um, it's in charge of adding and removing entries in the dev directory. And it can also trigger events based on rules that are in the Etsy uh, Etsy directory, I forget, I forget the exact directory where there are. But uh, it, can, it can run scripts when a new device is plugged in. Um, it, can, it can also send events through a Netlink socket. And this is how it's possible for a user mode application to be notified of a newly connected device without continually polling for new devices. And Dbus is an inter-process communication mechanism that allows uh, applications to register for various system events, like uh, a new disk being added to the system. And then there is U-Disks, which I think it used to be called uh, Device Kit Disks, but they changed the name. Uh, and it provides a Dbus interface for dealing with disk devices. Uh, it uses the GU, lib, uh, the GU dev library, which is part of UDEV, and it uh, subscribes to events through the Netlink socket and republishes them through Dbus. And UDisks also has the ability to mount and unmount file systems, 
and uh, disks that are connected on the system. And that's actually what Nautilus and the GNOME desktop use is to get notified of new disks. And uh, the Dbus interface, the, the Dbus interface is actually easier to use for registering for events than the straight Netlink socket. Um, so it's pretty easy to write an application that can interface with U-disks. Um, so now I'll talk about file system drivers. And traditionally, file system drivers have been implemented in as kernel mode device drivers in the FS branch of the kernel source tree. And they operate at a layer between the low-level uh, disk bus drivers, like the uh, USB bus or the IDE or SATA buses. And, uh, and it works with the virtual file system, which is uh, an interface for the kernel and user mode to access and interact with um, file system concepts like files, directories, and permissions. Um, then, uh, I already mentioned it, but there is a user mode file system driver architecture called Fuse, or files, uh, file systems in user space, which lets you write a file system driver that runs in user mode. And like I mentioned, it's used by the NTFS driver that Ubuntu uses. And then there's something called GVFS, which is the GNOME virtual file system. This isn't really a traditional Linux file system. It operates totally in user mode, and it can only be accessed using certain libraries like uh, GIO, GVFS itself, or, uh, or you can access, uh, there is a fuse mount point in the .gvfs directory uh, of your home directory. And uh, so files are referenced in GVFS through URIs, and you can actually use it to access files over FTP or SMB or DAV or HTTP or a lot of other network protocols. So that's, uh, you can use that to like, browse network shares through uh, GNOME just as easily as you can in Windows. So it is possible for vulnerabilities to exist in file system drivers, and a few have been discovered before if you search for a uh, CVE database. And the specific kind of bug that's useful for physical attacks or for infecting a system with malware are going to be bugs that deal with uh, how the drivers handle low-level file system structures, like the code that parses the low-level file system structures. And if you're able to find a vulnerability in a kernel mode file system driver, and you can execute arbitrary code, um, that code does run in kernel mode. And like I said before, it can be pretty useful for getting into a system if you can execute arbitrary code in kernel mode. So uh, if, you're, if you're able to attack a user mode file system driver, the code's gonna run in the context of whatever user mounted the device. Uh, so file system bugs like this are interesting because they're actually considered a local vulnerability. You need physical access to the machine and that's about as local as you can get. But if you're writing an exploit, um, it can be considered remote since you don't already have access to the operating system. Uh, you might not even know what, uh, what version of the kernel that you're attacking or if it's 32 or 64 bits. So that can make, making, uh, that can make writing a reliable exploit for uh, a kernel mode uh, driver pretty hard. So uh, and if the, F if the uh, exploit actually fails against the kernel mode driver, yeah, you end up crashing the system which is probably undesirable if you are trying to break into it. And another problem with exploiting file system driver vulnerabilities is that in some cases, you need to convince the operating system to read these file structures off the disk. So if you find a bug with the way that files are stored, uh, you might need the OS to try to read a file. And on a server system, it's really unlikely that any files are gonna be immediately read uh, when you insert a new, uh, connect a new device. So these kind of bugs might only be useful against desktop systems. Um, so how can you find file system driver vulnerabilities? Well, uh, you can get a copy of The Art of Software Security Assessment by uh, Mark Dowd and John McDonald and Justin Shu and uh, read all the source code. That's, that's, a, that's kind of the hard way to do it. But uh, uh, you can also use uh, static analysis, uh, automated static analysis. So for example, use Lint or CLang or a commercial solution like Fortify or Veracode or the rational software analyzer that is made by my employer, IBM. Um, you can also fuzz file system drivers, and Linux actually makes it really easy to do this because uh, basically any block device, such as a file, um, can be mounted as a volume. And people have done this for years to, uh, for example, adding swap space to their system. Um, you use DD to create a large empty file, uh, you format it with a file system, and then you can mount it. Uh, and TrueCrypt is also able to mount files as a file system. So, uh, so one way that you could use this for fuzzing is to create a file, format it with a file system image, and then randomly change bits. And uh, of course, you can also make your fuzzing a little bit smarter if you know a lot about the actual format of the, um, of the file system structures themselves. You can also take advantage of some of the more advanced fuzzing techniques. Uh, if you're running in a virtual machine, you can do uh, some code coverage analysis or taint analysis like Charlie Miller and Ben Nagy are always talking about. All right, so now I'm going to get into some of the higher levels of the operating system. Uh, GNOME Nautilus is part of the GNOME desktop environment that the uh, Ubuntu desktop Linux uses as the desktop. And Nautilus itself is the file manager, and it's also, it's also the desktop itself. It's the, the icons on the desktop are rendered by Nautilus. And it supports most or all of the free desktop.org uh, desktop specifications. So if you don't feel like digging through the code and trying to figure out how it all works, 
Um, you can read through the freedesktop.org specifications and it tells you uh, about a lot of the features that it has and how they should be implemented and how they should work. And uh, so something that not many people know about Nautilus is that it's actually responsible for detecting new disk devices being connected to the system and then mounting them. And like I said before, it uses the DBus interface uh, provided by UDisks to do this. And it's, it's in kind of a roundabout way that I'll get into in a couple of slides. So Nautilus is also, uh, Nautilus will also automatically open a window to browse files on a newly connected file system uh, when one is mounted. And this feature can be disabled, but it's turned on by default and it's a bit of a security risk. And so the reason that it's a security risk is that Nautilus will start generating thumbnails for all of the files in the root directory of a new storage device that you connect. And this can be bad, and it happens even when the screensaver is disabled and locked, or the screensaver is running and locked. So if you've never seen what Nautilus uh, looks like before, here's the file browsing window, and there's a selection of files here. There are some documents, there's my resume and my taxes, there are some pictures, and there is a font file. So. Um, without even trying to open the file, like I, I didn't try to open any of these files, the operating system r will read and parse each of these files to generate the thumbnails. And I don't really know exactly how many lines have executed, uh, or how many lines of code are executed to do this, but the chances are some of that code has a vulnerability in it somewhere. Yeah. Yes? Uh, so there, it works with the, um, there is one of the views that it doesn't, and that might, that might be the detail view, but I know it works with uh, small icons, medium icons, large icons, but uh, I think like the list view and the details view are the two that don't do that. So if you have that Yeah, that's a, uh, you can also disable thumbnail generation, which I'll be talking about uh, also. So yeah, either use one of the views that doesn't generate a thumbnail or uh, disable the thumbnail generation. Thanks. Uh, so here are the settings uh, for what happens when you insert a new device uh, uh, that's configured through, uh, these are configured through the Nautilus uh, file property settings, or the, uh, the, uh, the file browsing window property settings. So the first window that you see here is the auto run settings. And uh, this lets you configure what happens when an audio CD or a video CD or a DVD or whatever is inserted into the machine. Uh, these settings are actually all disabled by default, or maybe it's set to ask you, I actually forget, but um, uh, so by default, it's not going to run any of these any of the programs that are uh, that, that could be configured. So that's that's pretty safe. Uh, it's nice and secure. And Windows 7 works the same way. Uh, but the one thing that is enabled by default is the setting at the bottom: uh, browse media when inserted. Uh, so that's actually that's pretty dangerous, and I'll show you why pretty soon. So if you uh, if you don't need if you don't really care to have a window popping up whenever you insert a new USB drive, you should probably turn that feature off. Um, and the window on the right shows the preview settings. And this is where you can tell the system uh, whether or not to show thumbnails at all. And uh, so I actually recommend that you disable that. Uh, uh, it's a pretty good idea. Uh, so this slide shows how Nautilus detects new disks and uh, then mounts the volumes on them. So Nautilus uses the GIO library of glib2, which makes use of GVFS, which in turn makes some calls to GNOME Disk Utility, which uses Dbus to talk to UDisks, which uses a netlink socket to watch for UDEV events from the kernel. So it's pretty complicated, and if you actually want to trace through the source code to see what happens, there are seven or eight uh, applications, services, and libraries that you have to download the source code for. And it actually took me a while to figure out how all this works, and I'm actually very proud of myself for being able to do it. Uh, all right, so now let's talk about the thumbnailers themselves. So uh, like you saw in the picture, Nautilus will generate thumbnails for some file types. And this, the settings for the thumbnailers are stored in the gconf system, which is actually a lot like the Windows registry in that it's a uh, hierarchical collection of configuration settings. And thumbnails for image files, uh, like JPEGs and GIFs, are generated internally using the GDK PixBuff library. But Nautilus also allows external thumbnailers to be configured, and there are three enabled by default. Events thumbnailer for document files, Totem video thumbnailer for video and audio files, and GNOME thumbnail font for font files. And the generated thumbnails are actually cached in the thumbnails slash normal directory in the user's home directory. And you can cause a lot of uh, interesting mischief with this. Since you know that uh, an Ubuntu desktop Linux is going to be generating thumbnails for images on a USB drive, you could use this to load someone's PC up with a lot of illegal pornography and then report them to the feds. Um, so that doesn't even require exploiting a vulnerability, but you could cause a lot of serious trouble for the user of the machine, uh, which is another reason why you should disable thumbnails. So when Nautilus wants to gener generate a thumbnail for uh, an image, it uses the GDK PixBuff library. 
And this library, this library uh, relies on some of their external libraries for some of the image processing. And it uses libpng, uh, libtiff, and libjpeg. And if you've been following the vulnerability space for a while, um, you'll probably remember that all, all three of these libraries have had security vulnerabilities reported at one time or another. There's also some built-in code for some of the formats like BMP and GIF and a few others. And I also have on the slide a full list of the supported extensions on Ubuntu 10.10. .10. So if you can find a vulnerability in the parsing of any of these file types, you could use them for an auto run like attack against Ubuntu. Um, so what if you do find a bug in GDK PixBuff or an associated library? And these, this can be kind of tricky to exploit on a modern Linux distribution. Because first of all, uh, the thumbnailing itself happens inside of the Nautilus process. And that means if the process crashes, it has to restart. And when it restarts, it won't be opening the same file browsing windows that it had open before. So, uh, and if those file browsing windows are open again, then Nautilus will just crash on the same file. So you can't do brute force attacks against ASLR. Um, so one thing that actually might, that might actually um, help exploitation is that Nautilus isn't protected with uh, app armor by default. So if, you're, if you are able to achieve, to achieve uh, code execution, then there aren't really that many bar barriers to taking full control of the user session. Uh, so here's a screenshot of the Nautilus thumbnail settings in the GCOMF editor user interface. Uh, there's also a command line version if you would rather use that, but you can see here how the thumbnailers are set up. So each file has a, a MIME type, and for the MIME type, it has the external program that is called with uh, some arguments. Um, so uh, I'll talk about the external, how the external thumbnailer applications run now. And uh, so like I already said, they're configured with gconf, and they can be, here's the uh, command line that you can use to list them, uh, gconf tool dash r. Um, and in the configuration, there are usually three arguments passed, uh, the size, percent %s, uh, the name of the input file, and the name of the output file. So when Nautilus sees a file that it wants to generate a thumbnail for, um, it'll look up the MIME type for, the fi for that file extension and then look up the thumbnailer application for that MIME type. And Nautilus will also launch a separate process for each file that gets thumbnailed, which is actually helpful for exploitation and pretty bad for security, and you'll see why pretty soon. So let's take a look at how, yes? Uh, so the MIME types are stored in the, I think it's the user share MIME directory or MIME types directory, and there are a lot of XML files there that um, contain a uh, uh, kind of a glob version of the what extension, and it, ha it has like the name of the file type, a description of the file type, and the extension. So there are uh, API calls that you can make to figure out um, which, uh, which MIME type works for a, cer is for a certain file extension. Oh, so it's based on yes, yes, yes. So it, the settings are stored based on the MIME type, but it gets the MIME type from the file extension. It doesn't look at the uh, like the magic value or anything in the file header. It's purely based on the file type or on the file extension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So there's all there's all sorts of tricky things that you can do with that too. Thanks. So um, let's take a look at Events Thumbnailer, which is part of Events. It's the GNOME document viewer, and it's what a lot of people use for reading PDF files on Linux. And it's uh, generally considered to be a safer alternative to uh, Acrobat, but it's really not that much safer. Um, so it supports a pretty wide range of document types. There's PDFs, uh, Deja Vu documents, uh, CBR, which is uh, kind of a comic book format. It's basically a zip file full of pictures, um, DVI, PDF, and PostScript. And to generate a thumbnail, what Evans Thumbnailer does is render the first page of the document to use as the icon. And some of the formats are parsed using external libraries. I think PDF and PostScript are both parsed with uh, external libraries. But DVI files are parsed with a library that's included in the event source distribution itself. And Events Thumbnailer is the only thumbnailer that's protected with both PIE or position independent code and with App Armor. Um, so, but I'll get into both of those things a little bit later. Uh, the other thumbnailer, Totem Video Thumbnailer, it's part of the Totem Video Viewer. And it supports a whole lot of formats. Um, uh, using third-party libraries. And a lot of these libraries have had vulnerabilities before, and a lot of them probably still do. So when I have the list of extensions here, I pulled these from the XML files that, uh, uh, that store the MIME type information. So I, looked, I pulled the settings from uh, the thumbnailer settings, got a list of all the MIME types that, had, that were for video, and then used the uh, XML files to figure out what the file extensions actually were. So that's where I got these, uh, these extensions from. Um, so uh, Totem Video Thumbnailer is not protected by PIE or App Armor. And then there, uh, the last one is GNOME Thumbnail Font. And this generates thumbnails for a few different types of fonts, and it uses the FreeType library. And like basically every other piece of software out there, FreeType has had some vulnerabilities in it in the past, and it's not protected by PIE or AppArmor either. So what about mitigations? 
Um, so let's say you found a vulnerability in one of the thumbnailing libraries or programs. Ubuntu's, uh, I think it's probably one of the more secure Linux distributions out there by default with pretty reasonable security settings. Um, there is NX, which allows non-executable memory to work. ASLR, which is address space layout randomization, and that's basically enabled for everything. Um, it, uh, basically any allocated memory is gonna be at a random location, the stack and the heap and wherever libraries are loaded. PIE is position independent executable, and uh, that's something that's actually really needed for ASLR to be effective at all, because without it, a binary uh, will be loaded at the same location every time it's run, so you can use return to text or uh, ROP techniques. But not every binary is compiled with PIE, so that's something to look out for. Um, there's also something called AppArmor, which is kind of like a firewall for applications that can restrict which system calls can be made. Um, it can be used to deny access to certain files and directories regardless of what the operating system permissions are. Um, this can be used to prevent successful exploitation of an application um, because uh, your shell code is kind of run in a jail and if the, if the process itself doesn't have access to certain files or if it can't launch another process, then it really limits what you can do with, uh, with an exploit. With an exploit. Um, so if you've been following exploitation for the past couple of years, you'll know that NX can be bypassed using return-oriented programming or return to libc techniques. And that's where ASLR comes in, which mitigates ROP because for ROP to work, you need to know the address of certain libraries in memory. And AppArmor can actually be pretty tough to get around, but there are some weaknesses. And first of all, the protection is defined in profiles that are configured uh, per application. So if there's a weakness in a profile, it can be used to escape the AppArmor jail. And there are actually some things that AppArmor can't protect against. And an example of this is uh, if an application is allowed to make network local, uh, le uh, local network connections, you could use the X11 libraries to connect to the X server and get the X server to do things on your behalf that you might normally not be, or that you might not normally be able to do with AppArmor. So uh, ASLR and PIE, I, pu I put them together, but uh, so the way to defeat ASLR is with brute forcing. And the way that this works is you keep trying the same exploit over and over, hoping that the address for your return to libc or rop uh, exploit will get the right set of addresses and your exploit will succeed. Uh, and this doesn't always work for all exploits though. So for example, if your exploit crashes a process that doesn't restart, you can't really brute force the addresses and you only really get one chance for your exploit to work and it probably won't. Um, we can brute force ASLR with thumbnailers though, at least the external ones. When Nautilus launches a thumbnailer and it crashes, it doesn't care. It keeps trying to uh, thumbnail all the other files in the directory. So it's gonna keep launching this thumbnailer process over and over and over for each file. And that means that you can just uh, put around three or 4,000 files in a directory and hope that one of them uses the right ROP address set for your exploit to succeed. And uh, so while I was uh, researching ASLR on Linux, I noticed something that was kind of strange about how it worked by default. Uh, so this graph here shows a count of how many times libc was loaded at a certain address when running Evans Thumbnailer a little over 40,000 times. You can see here that there is a big spike in the graph for a certain range of addresses. Um, there are some addresses that were used 100 times and there were some that were only used once or twice. So while the address chosen at each execution is random, the distribution of uh, addresses in the long run isn't that random. Uh, there are some addresses that will be used much more than other addresses. So based on some testing that I've done, I only needed around 4,000 exploit files in a directory to have a really good chance of uh, having the right address for a return to libc exploit. Now I really don't know why this is. Um, it, someone should probably look into it. I haven't looked into it. Uh, I'm sure someone smarter than me can probably figure it out. Um, I wrote a shell script, or actually it was a Python script that launched the process and then um, used the, uh, got the process ID and then used the uh, proc PID slash mmap uh, I think it's the mmap file in the uh, proc file system, and that tells you uh, which address each of the library uh, each of the libraries are mounted at. So you use the uh, it's like slash proc the process ID and then slash maps I think is what it's called. And it tells you what uh, address each library is at. So that's that's why I use that. The uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to give out the script or not, but it's uh, I'll, I'll I'll talk to my uh, employer and see if I'm allowed to give out that script because it might be pretty useful for other. Yes. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it's pretty simple. It's uh, it's just like. Uh, 20 or 30 lines of Python that does it. Uh, so now that we can defeat ASLR with a thumbnailer exploit, uh, what about AppArmor? Um, uh, so the only, th the only thumbnailer protected by AppArmor is Evans Thumbnailer, but uh, the AppArmor profile does have some weaknesses that could be used to get around it. And first of all, uh, it allowed read, read and write access to the user home directory, but it specifies a blacklist of files and directories that should be denied. And this is bad because with a blacklist, it's possible to leave some things out. And I actually did find something that they left out, and uh, that was Evans Thumbnailer. 
uh, we could write to the .config slash auto start directory in the user's home directory. And this is used by the GNOME desktop to launch programs whenever a user logs in. And it's basically like the startup folder in Windows. So you can just drop a shortcut in there and it'll automatically launch a file whenever you, uh, uh, whenever you log into the system. Um, so if your exploit could drop a couple of files there, um, and then you can convince the user to log back in. You could either kill the X server or reboot the machine. Whenever the user logs back in, um, it'll run those files. So that's one way that you could possibly get around AppArmor. But I did submit a bug report for that, and they fixed it. And I would like to apologize to Dr. Raid for doing that, because he hates when bugs are fixed. Um, so I also mentioned something about X11 before. And uh, X is the display, uh, it's the display server. And uh, client applications, uh, the things that show up, uh, the windows that show up, communicate using a network protocol. And it happens with port, uh, I think it's TCP port 6000. It starts with TCP port 6000. Um, and anyways, local applications running as the, the user that's running the X server will generally always have access to connect to the server and show a window and do various other things. So if an AppArmor profile allows connecting to the local X server, you can force the X server to take action on behalf of your process. So for example, um, some of the things that you could do are kill the screensaver, sniff keystrokes, or even inject keystrokes. And it should be possible to write a decent AppArmor profile for even Thumbnailer that denies any sort of network access because, I mean, it doesn't actually need network access uh, like Events itself does. Events needs to uh, connect to the X server to display the document, but the Thumbnailer itself doesn't. It's a command line tool. It generates files based on the command line arguments. And using X11 to evade AppArmor is really just one idea, but you might be able to do it with uh, some interesting things with the other IPC mechanisms, like using Dbus to send signals to other applications. So someone should look into that, too. All right, so uh, let's say that you found a vulnerability and are able to bypass ASLR and defeat AppArmor. Uh, you're able to execute arbitrary code against the system, defeating all the mitigations. So what sort of things that you can do are useful? Um, it really depends on what your goals are as a hacker or a penetration tester. But one of the useful things that you could do is copy all the files from the user's home directory. And this could uh, contain mounted true crypt, true crypt volumes, or uh, you could get browser cookies and documents and all kinds of good stuff, whatever's in their home directory. And since your attack is probably going to be USB-based, um, you can just copy the files directly onto the USB drive that you just inserted. But my personal favorite attack is killing the screensaver process. It's called GNOME Screensaver, and uh, even if the desktop is locked and it's asking for a login, you can uh, just kill this process and you'll have access to the desktop. So it really doesn't, uh, there, there's really any protection from you killing the, just straight up killing the uh, screensaver process to get in. Uh, another possibility is installing a backdoor. Uh, you could edit the local profile files or the auto start file that I mentioned before. And uh, you could use an, an additional exploit to elevate your privileges and install a rootkit and that'll give you remote access to the system too. So killing the screensaver is pretty fun and there are a few ways that it can be done. Uh, so like I said, it's just a process. It runs as the top window on the X server, and it can prevent you from uh, switching, using hotkeys to switch to other applications, but other than that, it's not really special. You can kill the process and the login window goes away. It's actually a lot harder to do this on Windows. Um, so like I already said, you can just kill the GNOME screensaver process. That doesn't work with the Events AppArmor profile, though. You don't have access to read the proc file system to get a list of the processes, uh, and you can't spawn any other process at all, so you can't just run kill all or uh, start a shell script. But in that case, you can actually write code that connects to the local X display, enumerates all of the windows with the X query tree API call, um, use X fetch name to get the name, look for the GNOME screensaver window, and then use X kill client to terminate the process. So if you do that, you, can, uh, you don't need to know which the actual process ID to kill the process. You can use um, something that AppArmor doesn't really protect against to kill the process. Um, so what about installing a backdoor? Um, so uh, I, told, I think I mentioned it a few times, but uh, the auto start directory is like the Windows startup folder. Um, the shortcut files in the GNOME desktop end in the .desktop extension, and uh, they're basically just text files. The specifications are part of the free desktop.org specifications. Um, you can also use the .profile or .bash profile scripts that are executed whenever a user logs in. And uh, so your script could either download a remote access trojan from the web or copy one from the USB drive. So it's really not that complicated if you want to uh, kind of remain having uh, remote access. All right, so now I'd like to talk about some zero day. And by zero day, I mean several weekday, since these bugs were reported in December and they were fixed earlier this month. And once again, I apologize to Dr. Raid for doing that, and he really hates, because he really hates when bugs are fixed. Um, so I found four vulnerabilities in events dealing with the way that it processes external font files used by DVI documents. 
And DVI files are generated from LaTeX documents, and I don't know anyone that actually uses them for uh, over something like PostScript or PDF, but Ubuntu's build of events does handle them, and I think uh, Mandriva Linux uh, does too. Fedora, I don't think does. Um, but anyway, since events does handle them, it's a perfectly legitimate target for bug hunting. And the bugs I found were all memory corruption bugs. I found them all manually just by reading the source code. I didn't do any fuzzing or uh, automated static analysis. So if you actually tried those things, you'll probably find a lot more bugs. Um, so you can do that and have them all fixed. Um, I found, uh, so at least three of them could be used easily for code execution. The other one I'm not too sure about, but uh, it is a heap overflow, so I'll just assume that it can be used to execute code. Um, and one of the interesting things about this bugs is that they're actually easiest to exploit uh, in a US, using a USB drive as the attack vector. Uh, the font files that you specify in the DVI file can be uh, absolute or relative path. So the file, if the file system doesn't find the font in the normal font directories that it's going to look in, um, it can use the relative or absolute path. And the relative path is relative to the user bin directory where events is, so it's not that useful, but uh, being able to specify an absolute path is really, uh, really comes in handy because all USB drives are mounted in the media directory with a uh, name that comes from the volume name. Uh, so this means it's really easy to predict where uh, your file is gonna be and where your font files are gonna be. It's actually pretty hard to exploit something like this remotely, like if you send someone a zip file with uh, these multiple documents because if they extract them, um, the uh, font file has to be on the file system before the DVI file is parsed, and you don't really know where they're gonna extract it. Um, so, like I said, USB is actually the easiest attack vector for something like this. All right, so uh, I'll take a closer look at one of these bugs. And this one is CVE 2010-2640, and it's a bug in the handler for .pk font files. And this file, pk.c, is part of something called mdvilib. It was written in the year 2000, and it hasn't really been touched since then. Um, I actually noticed that there were some security advisories from Mandriva Linux that uh, they identified other libraries that were using similar code. So definitely check that out if you're worried about this kind of thing or if you want to find some more bugs. And this is a pretty good reason why open source projects shouldn't really include bundled libraries. Uh, MDVILib should have been uh, maintained separately, and so any other application that was using it could be patched, but really it's hard to say what, uh, what, li what uh, applications are using without downloading all their source and just checking for it. But basically any, any application that's gonna process DVI files may be using this library. So take a look at the code. Uh, first of all, uh, look at cc, int cc at line 425. It's a signed integer. Uh, and you can see that it gets assigned from the fu get four function, um, which is a four byte or a 32 bit unsigned integer from a stream. And it doesn't really matter that it's reading and returning an unsigned integer, uh, cc itself is signed. And you can also see that uh, further down there, there are four other values that are read from the file and assigned to various variables. And a few lines down from this, you can see that cc is used as an index into an array of structures. You can also see that some of the values that were uh, read in are all assigned to uh, a member of these, uh, one of these array structures. And there's a check earlier in the code to make sure cc isn't outside of the bounds of the array. Um, it'll re actually reallocate the code, or reallocate the array if it's too large, and there were, there were actually bugs in that too that they fixed. But um, uh, there was no check to see if it was negative. So this bug lets us write an arbitrary value to a semi-arbitrary location in memory. And it's semi-arbitrary because uh, it's relative um, to the location of font chars, and it needs to be lower on the heap than the, uh, or a, a lower value of, on the heap than the font chars array. And there's also an alignment issue. So each entry in the font chars array is around 80 bytes, and it's a structure called dbi font char, and we can only control a few of those 80 bytes. So anything that we want to overwrite has to uh, kind of overlap and line up correctly uh, when using a negative index into the font chars array. So uh, when you first look at this, it doesn't seem like it's going to be something that's really easy to exploit. So uh, I actually did find something that could be overwritten. Um, so uh, we can write to an address that is relative to, uh, I already said this, but we can write to an address that's relative to the font chars array on the heap. And because of ASLR, we have no idea where the stack is, so we can't just overwrite the return address of a function on the stack. What we can do is look for a function pointer on the heap. And luckily, there actually is one. It's, this code's in fontsearch.c, and it's the code that tries to find a font file that's specified in the DVI file. And specifically, uh, this takes the name of the font specified in the DVI file and runs a search function to find it. Uh, and each uh, separate supported font type has its own uh, kind of DVI font info structure that uh, lets you specify a custom search function. Uh, and these structures are on the heap, and they come before the font chars array. So we can overwrite ptr info.lookup way down there at the bottom, 
um, with an arbitrary value and take control of EIP. But of course, getting EIP is really only half the battle, and uh, as everyone in this room probably already knows. And this slide shows what the DVI font info and DVI font char structures actually look like. So to make a successful exploit, we need to make sure that certain members of the DVI font char structure line up with the lookup member of the DVI font info structure in memory. And you can see here that the, like the width, height, uh, X and Y values that are read from the DVI file as 32-bit integers are actually only 16 bits in the structure, so that's something else that's kind of a pain to deal with uh, when exploiting this. So uh, without app armor, it's, it's actually possible to write a really elegant exploit for this that doesn't even require uh, shell code. You can overwrite ptr info.lookup with the address of system in libc. Uh, and the first argument to lookup, uh, it's called name, is actually specified in the DVI file. So we can run a system with an arbitrary string parameter. We control the function and we control the first argument. And so uh, getting the overwrite to line up is actually pretty hard and it took me a while to do it, but it's possible to manipulate the heap by uh, modifying certain structures in the DVI file. And I was able to find the right combination of sizes for various DVI file structures that let me overwrite lookup with the address of system in one of, one of the uh, structures. And then in the DVI file, I used the path to a shell script on the USB drive as the name argument, or what was passed as the name argument. So uh, what my shell script did is kill the screensaver process. So all I have to do to create a really awesome physical exploit for a system is to put around four or 500 uh, DVI files and font files on a USB stick. And I need that many DVI files because a thumbnail gets generated for each one. Um, and in the font file, which, uh, which the font file contains the actual exploit payload, not the DVI file. Um, so uh, I used a set of, uh, I created around four or 500 DVI files. Each one used a different address for the system function because like I showed you before, the address of system is gonna be random, although it's not that random. So uh, the big problem I ran into when working on this exploit was app armor. Um, so all of the stuff that I just talked about is uh, just isn't possible with app armor. Um, I do have some ideas on getting around it though. Uh, so first of all, the PK font files have the extension PK600, and the AppArmor profile prohibits reading of those files. Only certain extensions uh, it's allowed to read, which means that if you have a legitimate document that is trying to read one of these files, it's not gonna work. Um, so that was actually pretty easy to work around. I ended up creating a symlink named uh, something.pk600 that linked to the real font file, which had a PNG extension, and this was enough to bypass this particular restriction in AppArmor. And second of all, and this is the really tough one, uh, AppArmor won't let us execute an arbitrary process. We can't spawn a new process. We can't use the system function to run a script. And there actually is a way that we can get around this, at least to do the type of exploit that I'm trying, but uh, it's kind of hard to do and I haven't actually been able to pull it off yet. But here's my idea. First of all, you need to use ROP to write a second stage shellcode loader. You need to be able to call mmap to create an anonymous memory mapping with write and execute permission. And then you need to open the file, uh, read it into memory uh, that you just allocated, and after that, jump to that code in memory. Um, so the second stage shell code that you just loaded can search the process's memory space for the X11 libraries using like an egg hunt technique or something, and uh, use the X11 APIs to enumerate the windows and kill, kill the screensaver like my other slide had. So I've tested each one of these things individually, but I haven't had a chance to get the whole thing working yet. So I know it's theoretically possible to pull this off, but I uh, just haven't had a chance to find all the ROP gadgets that I need for the second stage shell code. So my demo for this exploit is actually kind of lame. I had to disable both app armor, and I actually disabled ASLR too because uh, the demo takes too long with ASLR and it's not as uh, reliable as I would like it to be, and I want the demo to actually work. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, so it's really, uh, uh, so I had to disable app armor because my exploit doesn't get around it, and really that's my own fault for trying to audit an application that uh, uh, is protected by app armor instead of one of the thumbnailers that is not protected by app armor. Um, so here I will show my demo. Uh, this is my Ubuntu machine. Um, let's try my password. My password does not work. So here's my uh, magical cyber weapon USB uh, flash drive. Plug this in and hopefully it connects it. There the little light is blinking. Blink, 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 blink. Blink, 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 blink. And there it goes. The uh, exploit actually killed the screensaver. Thanks. 
So here you can see the, uh, this is the file browsing window that popped up with all of these uh, files. I, had a, I have a few of them there, but uh, the font files are actually hidden. I can, uh, let's see, ls-a media xf. Uh, I can't read the screen, xf. ls. Oh, okay. Thank you. I can't see the screen. <laughs> media slash xf. Thanks. I'm going to do dash A. So there you can see the uh, DVI files and then the uh, font files that are specified. And if I do uh, strings on one of these, uh, owned 116-2. Uh, Anyways, uh, I'll just skip that part, but the uh, DVI files end up linking to the .pk600 files, which actually cause the exploit. All right, yeah, so uh, my time is up, so uh, if you guys have any uh, questions, uh, I, my Black Hat DC paper was called Beyond Auto Run. Send me an email, jlarimer at gmail.com, jlarimer at us.ibm.com. Twitter, uh, shy demeanor. Uh, free node IRC, I hang out in pound pound RE. On Reddit, I hang out in uh, the R NetSec and R Reverse Engineering. My nickname is Roswell. And don't forget to uh, use the feedback.schmoocon.org for uh, feedback. Thanks.